Good day to you one and all. It is I, old stream farmer Justin Hawkins. Um, today I'm talking about this startling piece of news that has just a, uh, appeared on my desktop. So apparently babies that were born during the uh, pandemic have extra big eyes and they come out with funny stuff because they are actually ancient souls. Um, scientists speculate. No, that's, wait, this is a different... No, it's this story, the st uh, <coughs> streaming farms. Uh, there was an article by Ashley King for the Digital Music News. Rolling Stones speculate that artists could be losing around $300 million each year due to the high number of fake global streams, an estimated 3 to 4%. What does this mean? Who's doing this? Who are these monsters that are cruelly creating an imbalance in the uh, streaming charts? To what nefarious end? Who's benefiting from this and why haven't we stamped it out? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm getting all excited because, you know, this is big news. Justin Hawkins rides again. Again. And what do they mean by ancient? Anyway, do they mean like the seventh time around or so? I don't know. Okay, so. Streaming farms play music on existing uh, online platforms such as Spotify to massively inflate the number of times people have streamed a song. Listening bots can stream songs around 1,000 times per minute within minutes, uh, providing an artist with thousands of fake streams of their music. Now, I think the most important thing to consider is who's doing that? There's always been a tendency in the social media world to uh, inflate your numbers. There used to be companies that would provide uh, thousands of people who would log in, I don't know, click a like on something and then log back out again and then just do that constantly all day with all these fake accounts and then it would sort of bolster your numbers in the social media thing, which alarmingly is one of the considerations that a traditional record company might make if they're looking at your uh, band or you as an artist and then they want to sort of think about, oh, should we invest in this... Uh, is this a creative uh, proposition that that makes sense for us financially? And um, what what are their numbers? And then they look at those things, and there was and there have been instances when they've been artificially inflated. But now they're doing it with with streaming platforms. So presumably, a song that's on a streaming platform that's doing really really well already has a record label. So it won't be the record labels, will it? Or is it the record labels doing that to so that the song becomes more? appears higher in certain streaming charts so that uh, people get to listen to the song? Is it just something to do to promote a song? Um, Brian Harrington has written about how to identify them. Look at the top cities where, an art, where a song is streaming. Small towns listed as a top city is a big red flag. An artist's Spotify follower to listener ratio and um, social media engagement with fans indicate whether an artist's following is legitimate or artificially inflated. Does it matter? Do we care about this? I mean, does it, would it change your opinion of a piece of music if you heard it and then looked at where, which town most of the streams for that song were coming from? Because I'll, I'll listen to something and I, and I don't care about who else is listening to it. It could be millions of people, it could be no people. They could be from a small town, a small red flag town, or they could be from London town or, you know, Nashville or something like that. That just won't make any difference to me. Just listen to it and if you like it, that's good, isn't it? If you don't like it, well, don't stream it again. Just let the streaming farms take care of that. Um, here's why it's detrimental, though, to other artists. There's the pool of money that streaming platforms distribute out to the rights holders for the songs. So when the artist is faking with bot streams, they're taking chunks out of the pool that could be getting distributed to artists that are legitimately streaming with legitimate fan bases, Harrington tells Radio New Zealand. And it's already diluted, so small that it doesn't make a massive difference. But over time, that can account for lost money, or a lot of money. He explains that while the practice keeps money from other artists, it's more about getting attention by faking attention until it turns into real attention by generating revenue. I think that's what I was just suggesting a minute ago. So I reckon it's just a way of, of making people sit up and take notice of a song. Um, but the reality is, I think, you can lead a horse to water, but if the water tastes like shit... It's probably not going to drink too much of it before it realizes that the water tastes like shit. So, you know, you can uh, you can have a stream farm that's that's taking, for example, what's the biggest Dumpy's Rusty Nuts hit? Let me just look on Spotify. Actually, I'll do it on my phone. Let's go to the second most popular song on on Dumpy's Rusty Nuts. Okay, 
Fox Hill or Bust, I'm happy. So what would happen if I, this is a bad example because this is awesome, but um, if I appointed a streaming farm to inflate streams of Dumpy's Rusty Nuts singing I'm happy when I'm riding me hog. <laughs> would, it, would it then appear in Spotify charts and would, uh, you know, alongside the likes of Sam Smith, who I'm convinced has a fan base that is basically streaming it nonstop um, and then going into a coma and letting it stream on. Um, because the numbers don't make any sense. Who's, I mean, who's listening to stuff that often? I mean, I have a, a, an eight-year-old daughter, as some of you probably already know. She listens to things over and 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 over again. I think that that probably gives an unreasonable indication of the popularity of a song. It just means that one person enjoys listening to it again and again. I think that's one of the problems with streaming is that, you you know, there's no accounting for taste. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like so. Whereas in the past, it would be one small child buying a single. For example, it might be "Shut Up Your Face" by Joe Dolce. Listen to it again and again and again and again and again and again. And then uh, it doesn't matter how many times you listen to it. You buy it once, and that's it. But uh, you know, the whole economy of music has changed so much that uh, listening to Dumpy's Rusty Nuts again and 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 again makes a huge difference. So you only need to reach a smaller, more fanatic fan base, perhaps a fan base consisting primarily of uh, eight-year-old children who enjoy listening to music again and again and again and again, or a streaming farm. But at the end of the day, even if one child listens to a song eight billion times and it comes up on your thing and then it's this... Okay, well, this is, a, as I said, it's a bad example because now that Dumpy's Rusty Nuts singing I'm Happy When I'm Riding Me Hog EP uh, comes up, Box Hill or Bust, um, it, that does make me excited and I am probably more inclined to listen to it. Shit, this thing's working, isn't it? That's why they do it. If it's something that I just don't think is very good, then it's not going to make me listen to it. Um, attention faking has existed across most forms of entertainment dating back to the 19th century. The first known example called Clakes, where people uh, were people paid to provide raucous applause to performers at the French Opera. I've seen that actually at a funeral as well. As, as a younger man, I attended a, a very sad gathering to commemorate the passing of a friend of mine. And there was one person at the back who was obliged to, you know, sing raucously when the hymns were going, because otherwise everyone's just weeping. I was weeping. But this guy was singing quite horribly out of tune, so it was like, like the beginning of every... And it's just loud, you know, it wasn't in tune or anything. And uh, it was actually a provided, did actually provide some relief for me. I, I managed to laugh my way all the way through the service and the family of the my fallen comrade... Um, have never spoken to me since. I blame that guy, and I blame streaming farms as well. Does this prove that technology is still hindering the music industry rather than helping it? I mean, I think if indeed it is a popularity contest, then this is definitely muddying the waters and making it less clear as to who deserves the plaudits, really, uh, according to the wisdom of the crowd, you know. But um, I don't think it makes much difference when it comes to, like, actual critical thinking. When you actually listen to something and deciding for yourself whether you like it or not, it shouldn't matter that millions and billions of other people appear to have streamed it. Fuck those people. It's your own brain. You've got to think for yourself, you know. Are people too used to getting things for free now that they're unlikely to pay for albums again, let alone singles? Well... Music itself has regressed. When it first began, it was a service. It was something that minstrels played to, you know, portly kings in uh, court, courtyards within castles up and down the great nation of Middle Earth. And then gradually, with the advent of recorded music, it became a product. So it was something that you could buy and hold in your hand. A product. Now it's not that anymore. Nobody buys that and holds it in their hand anymore. Of course, there are peripheral products that you can consider merchandise associated with the creative uh, act itself. But the but music has become a service. So what you're actually paying for is to see a band play live or you're paying for the 
pleasure of streaming it momentarily. So it's regressed. Music is a service. That doesn't mean it's free necessarily, but for a lot of people it is actually free because there's a way of consuming anything for free if you're not prepared to pay for it. Nobody can force you. Yeah, we'll put the link to this um, original article in the description. Have a look at it and see what you think. Um, also, you can do a lot worse than listening to Joe Dolce and, and um, Dumpy's Rusty Nuts. I'll do more on both of these bands in the forthcoming uh, ensuing one day. Justin Hawkins writes again. Again. Don't forget to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. Think for yourself and watch one of these two videos before you do that. Nice one, guys. See you on the ice.